We're privileged to have as our opening speaker, Marshall Gans. Probably few people in the country have a better understanding of how change has occurred and how, how mobilizations occur than Marshall teaching at, at the Kennedy School with a long history and background. So Marshall, you're our lead person. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good, morning. good morning. All right, good. You got to get every. Okay, thank you. Um, no, thank you for the opportunity to uh, work with you this morning. Um, and I've been asked to uh, speak about leading change, organizing, and action. Let me just um, start by reflecting on the fact that in 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, visiting the United States, wrote, In a democracy, Knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On it depends all others. Attending to the role of civic groups, uh, churches, political parties, he argued that association was what could draw people out of their narrow individualism into a broader understanding of common interests that were required for democracy to work. The fact that associations that he, that he lifted up were voluntary meant they could also be a source of renewal for the civic values on which a healthy polity depends. And the democratic promise, in turn, uh, is that the combination of equal voices can, to some extent, command the political uh, resources to balance domination of those with greater economic resources. Making democracy work, in other words, requires not just the protection of, of individual liberties, but the creation of collective capacity. And that's what organizers do, is create collective capacity. Rooted in an understanding of leadership as enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty, a challenge to the to the hands in terms of skills, a challenge to the head in terms of concepts and strategy, and a challenge to the heart in terms of courage uh, and uh, the motivation and urgency to act. They ask three questions. First, who are my people? Uh, who are the people with whom I am to engage in exercising leadership for shared purpose? Second, what is their experience of the challenge? How is the challenge understood in terms of their own lived experience? And, th and therefore, what is the change they perceive they need? And thirdly, how can, um, how can they use their resources in new ways to create the power they need to achieve that change? In other words, it's not uh, a, a concept of providing services to clients. It's not a concept of marketing products to customers. It is engaging with people as a community to become a constituency. And constituency comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. In other words, it is about bringing people together to, to learn together, to decide together, to act together, and to win together. Uh, and that's what organizing uh, is about. And it's not something brand new that certainly was, certainly not been at the Kennedy School, God knows. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, uh, the first story I heard of organizing was actually in the book of Exodus, which was about a journey from slavery to freedom that a set of people took, uh, undertook. Uh, it's actually deeply rooted in faith traditions, or when the Greeks decided they didn't need kings to govern themselves, uh, a civic tradition. Or when the, uh, the Irish tenant farmers of a British landlord decided that they could get improvements on their land that he was refusing to do if they withheld their products long enough, they won, and his name was Captain Boycott. Now, yes, <laughs> that's where we get it, Captain Boycott. My point is that, they, that this approach to change is rooted in faith, in civic traditions, and in popular action, and has been for thousands of years all around the world. Now, in, in the U.S., in particular, uh, organizing has driven the great social movements that have been the ongoing, if episodic, sources of accountability, renewal, and change, whether from the left or the right or the middle. Crippled by fragmented, and this, I guess I don't have to make this case so much now, crippled by fragmented public institutions, 
uh, a result uh, of a need to protect slavery in one part of the country and encourage freedom in another, which goes, went into the formulation of the American Constitution. Uh, there is uh, a result of a very limited majoritarian democracy, meaning things like the Electoral College. Government has rarely been the source of the initiation of change from within. On the other hand, the impulse for change, ever since the Great Awakenings of the 1840s or even before, has played out more in the form of great movements of moral reform. They're not random. They emerge from the efforts of purposeful actors, individuals, um, and organizations to assert new public values, uh, form relationships rooted in those values, and mobilize political, economic, and cultural power to translate those values into action. They're not fashions or fads. They're collective, they're strategic, and they differ from interest groups in that they're not simply about reallocating goods, but they are also about redefining what a good is. Not content with winning the game, they try to change the rules of the game. So since the American Revolution itself, organized by Sam Adams and his Sons of Liberty, uh, temperance, abolition, suffrage, agrarian reform, labor reform, uh, racial reform, gender reform, environmental reform, and yes, the conservative reform movements have been driven by social movements. They begin as insurgents, they influence parties, they shape public policy. And uh, interestingly, uh, they, seem to, they seem to develop in such a way that they combine local action with national purpose. Uh, they're able to integrate local rootedness with state and national or regional uh, focus and strategy. Otherwise, we wind up like in D.C. with a lot of heads with no bodies or in local communities with bodies with no heads. And it's that integration that makes things work. Actually, E.E. E. Schneider, great American political science, said elites always try to localize conflict. Uh, and so insurgents always have to figure out how to redefine the turf so that they're in a place that they can then maximize their resources and bring those to bear. Um, in time, they also uh, shape themselves as campaigns. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould wrote about the two ways of understanding uh, time. He said, time is a cycle. That's the rhythm of continuity. Time is an arrow. He said, that's the rhythm of change, episodic, focused, intense. That's what we mean by a campaign. It's not just an electoral campaign. It's an intense stream of activity that creates capacity in the course of pursuing the goal. So that we, for example, we recruit volunteers. Now we can go out and identify voters. Now we can go out and persuade those voters. It is a scaled way of building the road as we walk it and as we learn in the course of it how better to, to do it. Now, leadership is at the heart of, um, of a movement. Uh, who accepts the responsibility to enable others to achieve this purpose <coughs> under conditions of uncertainty. Um, now, there are five practices that are central to this, um, uh, to this practice or to this way of thinking of leadership and organizing. And I'll just indicate them. There, there won't be a lot of time to discuss, perhaps on Q&A. The first is relationship building. Now, <coughs> Uh, relational work is foundational for the reasons uh, de Tocqueville was talking about it. Uh, relational work uh, is how individuals, uh, it's not the aggregation of individual resources, but rather the creation of collective capacity that makes a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And that begins in relational work, one-on-one -on -one work, community work, people connecting with each other. Because relationships, unlike contracts, don't end an exchange, they begin one because relationships grow and change. So while they're transactional, they can be transformational if commitments are made to them as foundational for work that we will do uh, together. Uh, so this is also one of the critical differences between mobilizing and organizing. Uh, these days there's been a lot of mobilizing because social media has made it very cheap to mobilize. Get the word out, show up in this place, aggregate a whole lot of individuals, and then it all goes away. And what happens? Mm, I don't know. In Takrir Square, they did a very good job of mobilizing. They didn't build the organizational structure to turn the mobilization to strategic purpose. And so who walked away with the benefits? The folks with the organization. 
the Muslim brothers in that case, and ultimately the army. My point is that there was a time when to produce those numbers, you had to build structure and leadership and depth to do it. Now it seems easy to do it, so we get a protest, but it never turns to power. And the real challenge here is how to turn protest to power. And that's what organizing is all about, beginning in the forming of those lateral relationships with each other so that we begin to act together. The second is tapping into the emotional resources because this is a head, heart, hands proposition, into the emotional resources to counter, to on the one hand, create urgency. And I think one of the great challenges in this movement has been how to make the important urgent, because the urgent will always count. But then how to create the urgency, but at the same time, the hope to counter fear, the empathy to counter alienation, the sense of self-worth to counter self-doubt. One of the major mechanisms through which we do that is, uh, is the use of narrative, of storytelling. Because what stories do, they tap into the emotional resources in our values, uh, what Charles Taylor calls our moral values, to find those sources of hope and empathy and self-worth and turn, and, and, and on the basis of that, respond to these challenges with agency and not with fear whether as individuals or in communities. So the role of storytelling and a public narrative, as we call it, linking my story with our story with the urgent challenge we face in this moment that requires action is a second critical dimension. The third critical dimension is strategizing, how to turn what we have into what we need uh, to get what we want, uh, strategy. Um, something we do every day just like storytelling, just like relationship building. The reason I mention these as distinct practices are that they can be focused on, that, that we can take what we understand implicitly, make it explicit, and in that way become purposeful and intentional about it. It also makes the point, though, that organizing is not some esoteric thing known by a few uh, uh, of the inner circle, but is actually something everyone is capable of. And that's the point. That's where its power lies. So strategizing about how to turn what we have into what we need to get what we want is how to translate our resources into power. And power is a pretty clear concept. If you need my resources more than I need your resources, who's got the power? Let me ask it again. You need what I got more than I need what you got. Who got the power? You. All right, now we understand power. Power is, power is not a thing. It's a relationship of influence. And so the question is to understand the interdependencies around us so as to find our points of leverage to create that influence. And uh, most simply put, the Montgomery bus boycott that started the modern civil rights movement in the United States was based on people discovering that, in fact, they all had critical resources that could become a source of power. Those critical resources, what were they? They all had feet. And if they use their feet to walk to work instead of getting on the bus, denying the bus company their bus fare, if they all did it together, this individual resource could become a source of collective power. It took a year and they won. That's what the American colonists understood when they dumped tea into Boston Harbor here as well. So this, oh, I'm getting the signal here. <coughs> we can talk more about power later. That was a very subtle thing. <laughs> Now you know where the power really lies. See, this is, all right. Uh, the, uh, the fourth, uh, uh, so we'll come back to strategy and power. We can talk about that, David and Goliath. Uh, structure is the fourth. Uh, movements often occur in reaction to oppressive st structures they experience as oppressive. So they, their reaction is to say, we want no structure. But then you get into what uh, feminist sociologist Joe, Joe Freeman called the tyranny of structurelessness, uh, which is we have no formal structure, but uh, we're all, you know, there's no leadership here. Instead, what we have is off-the-book structure with factions and, and uh, lack of transparency. And uh, maybe you've never had this experience, but I think a lot of us have. And so the point is to take, take charge of, of governing ourselves. Uh, and what we've been doing a great deal of work with is with leadership teams and with forms of distributed leadership that actually act to scaffold leadership development rather than suppressing it through the one leader, everybody does what that one leader says model. We think we can do much, much more uh, rich uh, work in that area. Finally is action. 
because all this doesn't add up unless it turns into votes, people, facts on the ground. And that requires eliciting the commitment because you don't buy people's commitment. You have to motivate it. You have to elicit it. And it comes through not making things easy, but making them significant. When I was working for the farm workers uh, movement, uh, we, we convinced uh, m millions of people not to eat grapes uh, as a boycott of grapes to get contracts with grape growers in California. Uh, it was not that it was so easy, but it was significant. Adding up, it mattered. That's what happened in Montgomery. So thinking about how to combine accessibility and commitment into uh, accessibility and significance into forms of action is a lot of where the action lies. So um, I think I'll just conclude now. Those are the five practices. Now I feel a little bit like Will Rogers who... Uh, once called a press conference, he had a, a solution to the German submarine problem in the war. And they said, well, what is it? He said, well, we just boil the ocean and then they'll all come up uh, and then we shoot them down. And they said, Mr. Rogers, how do we boil the ocean? He said, well, look, I gave you the answer. You know, you work out the details. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I've just done a little bit of that. But let me, let me just conclude with, with uh, three important questions to ask yourself that I always ask myself as foundational for this work. First, uh, these are three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who said, ask yourself first, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? It begins by taking responsibility. It's not about selfishness, but it is about the recognition of responsibility. Second, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what is to recognize our interdependence and our relationality with everyone else in terms of their objectives as well as our own. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Not advice to jump into moving traffic, but appreciation of the fact to avoid what Jane Addams called the snare of preparation. Change only begins with action. And in reality, learning how to make the change we want only will flow from taking action. In other words, understanding doesn't precede it. It flows from it. So I invite you to join the action. Thank you. Marshall, we could spend all day here with you. That was absolutely terrific. Change comes from action. Local action with national purpose.